Hello and welcome to the Redeemed Man podcast. I'm Paul Amos, founder of The Redeemed. The Redeemed is all about building men in community for Christ, an opportunity for men to come together, to realize that marching through life alone can be lonely and can be difficult. And we want to make sure that men sharpen, iron sharpens iron and men come together to be able to journey through life together and to do it well. And so today on our podcast, we have a very special guest. We're so thankful to have Zach Clinton, who's here with us today. And uh, Zach, welcome to the show. Paul, my friend, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to the opportunity and our conversation together today. Zach is an accomplished counselor. He's finishing up his Ph.D. at Liberty University. He lives in Lynchburg, Tennessee with his lovely wife, Evelyn. And we are excited about the opportunity to learn a little bit about you first and then jump into all the things that you're doing in your faith and your journey. I appreciate it, sir. Yes, as you mentioned, you know, my wife and I, Evelyn, we have been in this journey throughout our doctoral degrees here over the last several years. I'm finishing mine now in counselor education and supervision. My wife, Evelyn, is in her doctorate of nurse practicing, loves to kind of the primary care space of life. So she focuses on the physical, and I kind of focus on the emotional, mental, and spiritual. And so we have this holistic sense of health. But as you mentioned, I love the opportunity of counseling, walking alongside of the brokenhearted and the hurting, serving as the vice president of the American Association of Christian Counselors alongside of my dad, Dr. Tim Clinton, who's the president, my brother-in-law, Ben Allison, who's our CEO, and then Ignite Men's Impact Weekend, which I'm sure we'll get into and talk about kind of my heart for men. So I just appreciate, again, just this opportunity to share about all the incredible things that God is doing here in Lynchburg. That is awesome, and thank you for being here, taking time out of your busy schedule, and we're super excited to dive in. Before we get too deep into those topics, our audience loves to just get to know people a little bit. And so a couple of quick questions, if you're okay with them. Let's start with uh, what is your favorite thing to do with your bride outside of studying uh, and, and, and focusing on the ministry? My wife and I love just spending time in the outdoors. And so whether that's a bonfire of some sorts, you know, we love just to get outside and just to be quiet and be still. Uh, We love going out to our family farm and just spending some time walking around. We love going to the movies. We love going to putt-putt. Anything outside of kind of the everyday ordinary right now is something that is super simplistic, but we're super grateful for. And so I love just getting outside of the house with my wife. I love our time in the house together too, but getting outside and getting outside of that norm is probably the biggest thing that we are savoring in this season of our life. All right. That's wonderful. What book are you reading right now? Oh, my goodness. The book that I'm reading right now, I'm reading several, but the one that I'm reading is No More Excuses by Dr. Tony Evans. That's the one that is on my nightstand that I'm picking up every single day after my quiet time and just really kind of leaning into how do we embrace and how do we move past that loser's limp and take accept kind of accept responsibility and ownership for every single decision that we make to step into the calling that God has called us to as men for such a time as this. All right. I don't know if I'm putting you in an uncomfortable position, but I'm going to get you to give me the over under on wins for the Liberty football team this year. (laughs) Hey, I'm calling this. We're going to go undefeated again for the regular season. So we're going to say 13 and 0 regular season. And my prayer, and this is the amazing thing about college football expanding to 12 teams in the college football playoff, the top G5 school, which Liberty University was last year, they made it into the Fiesta Bowl and played Oregon. But I believe that they're going to have another chance to be the top G5 program in America with an undefeated regular season, and you'll see them in the college football playoff. So that's my word right here. Well, that would be exciting. I, I think that would be an awesome opportunity as a uh, as someone whose parents went to the University of Georgia and die hard red and black, even <laughs> though I went to Duke. Uh, I can tell you that if they end up uh, seated, I'll be pulling for them uh, unless they're playing Georgia. That's right. And uh, we'll see how that goes and uh, and who ends up playing who. Uh, Georgia's got a tough schedule this year, so yes. we'll see where they end up slotted uh, in, the, in the overall playoff themselves. Um, let's dive into it now and, and talk a little bit about your faith journey. Uh, and, and so can you tell us a little bit about how you've come to the place you are today and a little bit about, uh, you know, what's helped shape your faith to be able to affect the impact and impact the faith of others. You know, I appreciate the question, Paul, because 
that's the biggest thing for me. I grew up in a in a Christian home, right? So I had the opportunity of watching an incredibly active and dynamic faith that was on full display by both my mom and my dad, who were mm-hmm. very present in my life. They both are still two of my very best friends in the world, two of my heroes, two people that I look up to, I spend a lot of time with, a lot of conversations with, and I'm grateful for their wisdom and just the impact that they have entrusted and invested in me throughout my upbringing. And I have an older sister named Megan, so we both grew up in you know this Christian space, kind of this Christian sp- circle, went to a Christian school from the time we were in kindergarten all the way through graduation. Then we had the opportunity of going to Liberty University. So we have always been surrounded by faith. But for me personally, um, I was the kid, Paul, that grew up that kind of uh, was a perfectionist. I played a lot of sports, so I was very competitive. Um, I wanted everything to be perfect, and I placed a great emphasis on behavior. But what I started to recognize as I started to get older, I started to struggle sometimes with um, some performance anxiety throughout middle school years and stuff like that as related to academics as well as athletics. But I realized that I was really dependent upon the faith of my parents. And people would look at me and say, oh, well, because of who Zach's mom and dad are, we just expect him to be another really good kid. So I placed a great emphasis in that. I could rattle off any Bible verse. I could get 100s on all of my Bible exams and Bible class throughout high school and whatnot, but I hadn't quite made my faith personal yet. And I think that's where there were some challenges, whether it be through injuries, whether it be through broken relationships that I experienced even into college that really helped shape and transform my faith because I'm a firm believer that in our moments of powerlessness, God loves to remind us of his power first and foremost, but also reveal the character of his heart. And so there were some deep and dark and murky waters that I kind of had to navigate, like I said, when it came to certain aspects of my life. But those were the moments for me, Paul, where my faith actually became transparent. It became real and it transformed because it was so much greater than something that my mom and dad were able to display for me. But it was actually something that I was able to experience and encounter on my own. So I am so grateful now that I look back for some of the hardships and the challenges and the difficulties because I believe God used those seasons of my life to shape and mold me into the person that I am trying to continually step into and become today. Wow. Well, thank you so much. You know, for the outside looking in at you, uh, it'd be very easy for someone to categorize you as the perfect Christian all along the way. (laughs) <laughs> and for you to freely admit that you've dealt with your own difficult trials and circumstances, oh, yeah. which we may come back to in a little bit. I, I really appreciate you being candid about that and talking about the difficulties, because I think all of us have difficulties in our journey. Some self-inflicted, some inflicted by uh, the, the things that they've learned from others, and, and some just a part of the journey that God has tasked us to go on. Uh, and so I thank you so much for, for sharing that and for uh, for letting us know that. You obviously are are headed toward a career in counseling. Uh, You already are a counselor and a leader as the vice president, as you mentioned earlier, uh, in your family's organization. Tell us, though, what led you to counseling? And, and, And for some people, they want to follow in their parents' footsteps. For other people, they very much want to venture in a different direction. How did you go down the path of being in a in the same area and what what makes you passionate about it you know i think it goes back to when i was a kid growing up and just watching my dad watching what my dad displayed for me on a daily basis when it came to what true leadership really looked like my dad embodies uh, servant leadership and the way that he sits with people in the midst of their pain the way that he would walk alongside of individuals who are navigating hardship and challenge and difficulty and then just to see the gratitude that people had for my dad just for showing up for them for being present in his life but also what i always appreciated about my dad is that my dad never put his family, my mom, my sister, and myself on the back burner because he was so entrenched in ministry. I believe this, that if you do not prioritize things correctly, your ministry can become your greatest misery. And so being able to recognize that the home, your family, your marriage, your kids, right, those things are your Jerusalem that that really Scripture talks about. But a lot of people neglect their Jerusalem to reach the Judeas and the Samarias and the uttermost parts of this earth. And so I'm so grateful for the display that my dad did. That 
that kind of pushed me into following in my dad's footsteps. I always joke around, 28 years old, I still want to be just like my dad. And so just seeing the display that he gave, and I always will say that because of the love that my earthly father has shown me, I think I have a greater understanding of what the love of my heavenly father looks like as well. Beyond just the display my dad gave me, I also felt this call from a young age to empathize with other people, to walk alongside of them myself, playing sports, football, basketball, and baseball all throughout high school, played baseball at Liberty University for four years, had the incredible opportunity of potentially even going on to the next level, but just felt called into helping other individuals unlock their fullest potential. And I mean that in a holistic aspect. I love coaching, right? Whether it was the physical or the athletic, but beyond that, I wanted people to, in a sense, break free of the bondage that they are in when it comes to their mental health or their emotional health or their relational health, especially though their spiritual growth and discipleship throughout their life. And so that was my biggest thing is, hey, you know what, God, I feel called into this ministry. I feel called into this space. And I don't just want to go where I'm comfortable. I want to go where I'm called. And so in knowing that it's one of my greatest joys to sit with people who literally come into my office and come into sessions and they look at me and they say this, you know what, Paul? I feel hopeless today. Mm. And I just try to remind them of the fact that I learned at a young age through a man named Dr. Rick Rigsby, who I, I share in my book, even if in the first chapter, his story is of his late wife, Trina. When he was watching Trina battle with breast cancer, he was watching her to the point where he eventually had to watch her, the Lord call her home. And here he is on his knees weeping at the foot of her casket. And his dad, who he has a, a massive um, speech that on YouTube that went viral years ago, millions and millions and millions of views, but it's called Lessons I Learned from a Third Grade Dropout. And so his dad, who was that third grade dropout taught him a lesson, an invaluable lesson in that moment when he came over and he was just trying to console his son weeping at the foot of the casket of his late wife. And his dad looked down and said, are you all right, son? And Dr. Rick looked up at his dad and said, dad, I feel like I've lost all hope. And his dad looked back down at him in that moment and said transformative words when he said, son, you cannot lose something that God gave you. You haven't lost hope. You've just lost perspective. And so when people look at me in counseling sessions, I share with them, you know what? I want to help you regain and reframe that perspective because you cannot lose hope, right? Sometimes it just needs to be redirected because hope has a name, and that name is Jesus. And with that hope living, which it always will be, I tell you what, we can keep moving forward, and change is always possible. That is wonderful. You mentioned your book, Even If, so let's jump there. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it was like to write your book and what type of trials did you have to go through uh, to make it happen? I tell you what, even if was a process, Paul, um, it, it was a message that I feel like God put on my heart probably four years ago. And so I was co-authoring it with a very dear friend of mine named Max Davis. And so with all of the different things that we have going on, um, I wanted to be able to have somebody help me throughout the writing process. And so Max, you know, I haven't really ever shared this before, but Max got really sick with COVID. And when he was sick with COVID, he ended up getting what they called long COVID, which mm. it was like a prolonged season. And it was a very challenging time for him. And so we were, I mean, we were praying on his behalf day in and day out, month in and month out. And, you know, eventually it got to this point, thank God that Max is now healthy. Max is still continuing to press on, continuing to do the Lord's work. But it got to a point where right after all of this COVID stuff began to happen and it all played out the way that it has, and it's just been a disaster. Let's be honest, the last five years, we say in our space in the mental health world that we move from a mental health crisis into a mental health disaster. Things like anxiety, depression, I mean, addiction, suicide, those numbers are all on the rise. And I mean, it's a very, in a sense, fear provoking time. And so what I wanted to do is bring a word of resilience for such a time as this. And so when I have done a lot of research around the topic of resilience in my doctoral studies and my dissertation work and efforts, there's no concrete definition, but the common theme of the phrase resilience is positive adaptation in the presence of adversity. And I started to think back Paul, to all of the moments in my life where there was adversity, where adversity arose and the messages that I got from my dad and other mentors in my life that just breathed life into me and invested in my life. And here I was thinking, you know, how could I sum up resilience into a very short phrase? And it was super simplistic, even if, right? It comes out of my favorite account in scripture. 
in Daniel chapter 3, where three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were in a sense in a predicament. They were in an adverse situation where King Nebuchadnezzar in those days, who was the ruler over the entire empire of Babylon, he had the opportunity to put in this law or this decree that said he was going to build this massive pillar of gold, 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, this massive statue. And every time the sound of music was to be played, everyone in all of the land was supposed to come down and bow down to it. So in other words, sound familiar, people had the opportunity of conforming to culture or conforming to their circumstances rather than conforming to Christ, conforming to the Almighty God. But in the midst of this season, there were three dudes who just refused to bow the knee to anything besides the Almighty God. Mm. And, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar's brown-nosing fan club approached him and just They let him know that there were three dudes who were being disobedient. So King Nebuchadnezzar, probably mad, furious, embarrassed, he calls them into his presence. And he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true? Like, is it true? He had just promoted them in the kingdom. It says in Daniel chapter 2, just promoted them underneath him, like high up in leadership. So he loved these dudes, but he's like, are you serious? Are you really going to go against my word? I'll give you one more chance, right? We're going to play the sound of music. If you choose to bow down and worship, very well. All's going to be fine. But if you don't, um, I have a burning hot fiery furnace and I'm going to throw you in there just so you know. So there's a death sentence awaiting these three men. And I love the way that they respond to King Nebuchadnezzar. They're saying, you know what, King, like with all due respect, you don't even have the right to approach us about this matter. In other words, we've already made up our minds. And then they offer us this three-tiered prayer That's beginning in verse 17. They say, not only do we believe that our God is able, but number two, we believe that our God will deliver us from your majesty's hand. In other words, they are praying with confidence in this moment. But then they give us those two transformative words that have shaped and impacted my life for years, and I know they will for years to come. But even if he does not, we will not worship your gods or serve the image of gold that you have put up before us. And so it's this idea, Paul, that there's a big difference between what if, only if, and even if. A lot of people allow the fear of what if to make them settle for what is. In the mental health space, we call this analysis paralysis, where people are so afraid of what could happen tomorrow that it leaves them idle or crippled in the current moment of today. What if leads to a very comfortable or complacent faith. But then there's only if, or there's these people that are very result-driven. It's all about the outcome. Only if, you know, I get out of this what I was hoping to get out of it. Only if it's comfortable or convenient. Only if it works out in my favor. Only if leads to a very contingent faith. But then there's this even if mantra of a select few group of individuals that I want to infuse into society and culture for such a time as this. Even if it's hard, even if it's lonely, even if you're the only one doing it, even if you don't get out of life what you were hoping or expecting or praying or preparing to get out of it, I'm going to stay true to my faith, to my family, to my friends, and to the standard within me rather than succumbing to the expectations, opinions, or circumstances around me. That's that idea of even if, because that leads to a courageous faith when we recognize that God cares more about our character than he ever will our comfort. So that's the idea behind the book, Paul. Even if, a lot of life lessons in there uh, that we unpack, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. And I pray it could be impactful for all the listeners and viewers today as well. Wow, that was a great summary. And I very much appreciate it. Excited to dive into that. Where can our audience pick up your book? I assume Amazon? At Amazon, Mm. kind of wherever books are sold. Also at AACC.net and then my website at ZachClinton.com as well. That's awesome. Okay, so I want to go down a bit of a rabbit hole here with you. Just because I'm a father of four and uh, and I'm I'm trying to raise up the next generation. Mm. But I've noticed in this generation there is a lack of resilience to some Mm. extent that as a counselor, I'm curious if you're noticing that, or is that a is that me just pontificating on a small sample? Is that a larger sample? And if so, what can we do in this period of post COVID and post COVID, where you're saying we're seeing dramatic increases in depression, anxiety, all different things? You know, what can we do to rebound and strengthen our ability to be resilient? Mm. It's so good, and I'm so glad you asked this question because I've heard that a lot as well, that this next generation is soft, right? That's what a lot of people have told me, and I'm like, you know what? I don't, I don't really fully buy into that. 
And I don't believe that. And I think it's our job and responsibility to raise up then the next generation as you are doing, Paul, and being able to invest in them every single day. A lot of parents are really good at instructing their kids. They're really poor at investing in them. And Mm. so the one thing that I want to be able to teach and help individuals, every time I work with kids, when I work with youth and adolescents and young adults, I always try to tie in the entire family because what we have to recognize is that our environment shapes and heavily influences our experience in this life. A lot of kids are coming from broken homes and are going through the ringer. They're going home every single night watching mom and dad yell at each other, having, in a sense, very dismissive parents that are emotionally unattuned or unavailable in their lives. And then we're expecting them just to be resilient and to, in a sense, giddy up for the ride of life. And that's just not even right. And so Mm -hmm. what I want to help remind people of in this space of resilience, especially in the mental health field, is a a work of a dear friend of ours here at AACC. Her name is Dr. Kathy Cook. And Dr. Kathy teaches um, on a book called Raising Resilient Kids, Helping Them Live Lives or Lead Lives with Confidence. And Mm -hmm. in this book, I love it, in chapter one, and this is why I always cite her because in all of my research, um, you know, she summarizes it best. Chapter one, she says that resilience is twofold. It's internal and it's external. Internally, it can be broken down into three facets. The first thing is that it's a mindset. So for instance, a simplistic principle I teach in my book is that our perspective steers our potential. One of my dear friends, Inky Johnson, always says, how you view what you do will always affect how you do what you do. I want to help people understand this, that thoughts become things. What we see in our minds, we can hold in our hands. And so life, you know, we get out of life, not just what we put into it, but also what we look for in it. And so yes, Number one, resilience is a mindset. Your test can become your testimony. Your mess can become your message. Your pain can turn into your greatest purpose. Boom, perspective. But number two, it is actually, in a sense, a recovery process is what she calls it. And so a lot of people think of resilience as the ability to bounce back. Yeah, that's great, and that's a great term that a lot of people use. But when there's a lot more severity maybe to the trauma, to the challenge, to the pain that somebody is enduring, maybe we shift the language away from bouncing back to simply coming back and realize that resilience is not an instantaneous process. It is something that we have to invest in day after day, morning after morning, moment after moment, and able to actually press into the resilience that God created us for in that abundant life he references in John 10.10. But then beyond the mindset, beyond the recovery process, she says it can become a learned ability. In other words, whatever, it's not about what you do occasionally, it's about what you do consistently. When you show up with the resilient mindset and when you recognize it's not instantaneous, but you buy into the process of it, then actually it becomes like a wired into your DNA, like second nature to you. I don't even have to think about being resilient because I naturally am now that I've practiced it time and time again. But beyond the internal, that's just chapter one, the rest of the book. And this is where she hits people straight in the face. She says to all you moms, dads, teachers, coaches, counselors, professors, whatever you may be, the greatest ingredient And being able to raise up a resilient next generation is you. And she talks about how resilience is rooted in relationship. My dad puts it this way, that the antidote to trauma is healthy and secure relationship. And so when we recognize that how I typically will teach this principle is I'll have two basketballs and I'll be holding. One of them is completely inflated, has all of the air in it so it can bounce really, really high. The other one is completely deflated. And I try to have this principle of, you know, these basketballs are very symbolic of individuals. How does a basketball get deflated? Well, if any of our listeners or viewers understand the game, a basketball deflates when it's neglected or when someone or something squeezed the air right out of it. Just the same thing for the next generation of kids, right? A lot of kids are being neglected, Paul. A lot of kids are getting the life squeezed right out of them, whether it be a conversation, whether it be an interaction, but then being able to recognize, okay, What are the necessary ingredients that we need to invest in the lives of these kids, just like these two basketballs that were bought on the same day at the same price from the same store? It's being able to recognize things like encouragement, things like support, things like challenge, and recognizing the balance between those things because when we do it right, then all of a sudden they have the opportunity of stepping into the calling and purpose for which they were created in the first place. So kids, right? need all of those same ingredients that are life-giving and not life-draining. Wow, that's great. If anything, I feel like I just looked in the mirror. 
Uh, mm. You know, a little little view into our generation and a little view into how we as parents are impacting these kids. And uh, I very much appreciate you helping me frame that with your expertise and understanding uh, and explaining that on resilience. Well, let's shift from resilience to redemption. Yeah. And mm. so uh, since we are the Redeem podcast, we ask our guests, what does redemption mean to you? And I'd love to hear your perspective. Mm. So my mother shares a story about my grandmother. My grandmother um, was adopted at a very, very, very young age, maybe her first few days of life. And my opa, so my mother's grandmother, my great-grandfather, he, um, he was someone who was a pastor back in his days up in kind of Canada area, Montana area. And they were, had already adopted one daughter, and they wanted to then actually adopt um, a second daughter. Back in those days, pastors or people working in the religious space actually were able to bypass, in a sense, paying any price or anything like that for any child. They didn't have to do anything. They could just, in a sense, go sign the paperwork, and they would have um, a child afforded to them. And so when they wow. went, they had the opportunity of adopting my grandmother. And I'll never forget, there's a story, though, that her older sister named Myrna, after they had adopted her, she went back and she paid a nickel to one of the nurses because she said, well, there can't be something so, so good without having to pay the price. And so redemption to me is recognizing that we serve a God when what redeemed actually means is that God was willing to pay the price for each and every one of us. And when we recognize that we serve a God who loved us so much that he gave, as John 3.16 talks about, his one and only son, to not be born in a lavished mansion, but to be born in a lowly manger, to live a sinless and a perfect life, to be able to be the propitiation for our sins, to die a substitutionary death in our place, to then rise again three days later, defeating both sin and death just for the opportunity for us to know him and to make his name known so that way we would have the opportunity of spending eternity forever in his presence man when i think of redemption all i can think about is gratitude because i am so undeserving paul we are all so undeserving but by god's grace thank god that grace is sufficient for each and every one of us that's what i think of what comes to mind immediately when i think of redemption wow that was a beautiful definition i love that uh, dead on and, and speaks so much to the heart of what we believe here at The Redeemed, and uh, I appreciate you sharing that. Hmm. Well, let's talk about your Built Different initiative. Uh, obviously, yeah. uh, you've, you've put something together uh, for men and for, uh, for people that is uh, truly special, and so talk a little bit about your initiative here and what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I appreciate you asking that question as well. You know, when it comes to Built Different, uh, I had the opportunity of starting a podcast out uh, probably three, three and a half years ago now. Um, it was right in the middle of COVID, and it started out as something that I called the Ignite Men's Battle Cry series out of our Ignite Men's ministry. And I just wanted to invest into the lives of men in knowing that there were so many battles that we face on a daily basis. Right? I speak a lot into um, the challenges that men are going up against, especially in the mental health space, things such as loneliness, things such as pressure, things such as their past, things such as pornography. I mean, the list could go on and on and on. And so in knowing that there are a lot of challenges, I just wanted a place that could, you know, just be a viable option to speak into the hearts and the lives of men. And so started that podcast, then eventually it got transitioned into this idea of, you know, what does it look like to look built different, to be rooted and to be built up in Christ as Colossians 2, 6, and 7 talk about. And so that was my idea behind build different. How can we build people holistically and just have conversations and testimonies that are encouraging, reminding people that we don't get freed from the fight, but we get freed for the fight and recognizing that it is about things like perspective. It is about things like preparation. It is about things like perseverance and patience and purpose and people and praising God in the midst of and before our breakthrough. And so that's kind of what the podcast has turned into. That's kind of what the initiative is all about. And that's kind of what we're also all about um, at Ignite Men's Impact Weekend and our ministry through Ignite is being able to remind men and align their everyday passions with God's eternal purpose for their life. And I assume off your website you can find your podcast, but I assume you can also find it off of Apple Podcasts and other things if our audience wants to connect with you on that. Yes, sir. Definitely on the website at ZachLynn.com, but also wherever you listen to your podcast, you can find the Build Different Podcast. Yes, sir. We're, we're doing it the same way. I understand. Yes, indeed. Well, let's, you mentioned on a couple of occasions the Ignite Men's Weekend. 
Yes. And so uh, let's talk about that. I mean, I, I'm blown away reading about it and realizing how many people you have coming to it. But talk to the heart of what your message is and what you're trying to accomplish through that. My dad started Ignite years ago, probably 16 or 17 years ago when I was just a young kid. And he wanted to have this event that brought men together to remind me as his son that there were still people in society and culture that I could look up to and aspire to be like. Men that, again, were not bowing the knee, but men that were taking a bold and courageous stand for such a time as this, whether it be professional athletes, whether it be pastors, motivational speakers, whatever that looked like, he wanted to have that space that would encourage the hearts of men and help recognize that they are never alone in the midst of this fight. I believe that that's the message out of Daniel 3, that God gives us friends for the fire, but also there was a fourth man in the fire. And so that's what Ignite's all about, just having men gather together to be, in a sense, educated, equipped, empowered, and encouraged to become the man that God has created them to be. So this past this past Ignite was absolutely insane. We had over 5,000 men, a sold-out crowd at Thomas Road Baptist Church, literally wow. standing room only. We had a wait list of over 2,000 men that just wanted to get in the building. So we had to, in a sense, um, have the whole entire simulcast where we were able to have other people come in and virtually watch the event. But I mean, it was insane from Tim Tebow to Brian Dawkins to Eric Thomas to, I mean, President Donnie Costin from Liberty was there. Craig Grishel. We had Shane and Shane in concert. It was powerful. And God does something special when the boys get together. And then we also, the cool thing about Ignite, because we have a sister ministry called eWomen that does the same thing, but for women and travels the country hosting events as well. But with Ignite, um, we also have workshops. And this is where my dad had a heart to bring in, in a sense, the man that typically wouldn't go to church because he felt judged mm -hmm. or because he felt like, you know what, that just that place isn't for me. I don't feel accepted or belong there. So dad has these workshops that he conducted from the very beginning where it could be things on hunting and fishing to every sport you can imagine, but as well as diving deeper into how to become a man after God's own heart, how to become a better husband, how to become more emotionally attuned and invested in the life of your child. And so a lot of equipping takes place at Ignite, but I tell you what, it's a lot of encouraging too, because we just want men to realize that they're not alone. We have our upcoming one coming up October 18th and 19th down in Grand Prairie, Texas. Uh, we're super excited for that. And then we'll have our other hometown one in Lynchburg, March 7th and 8th coming up in 2025 as well. Wow, that's exciting. And I, I imagine both those events are hard tickets to come by, uh, but yes. exciting to say the least. Tell me a little bit about how you shape the agenda for those events. I mean, do you find yourself trying to stay on a single message over a long period of time, or do you find yourself shifting the message at Ignite uh, for this conference, uh, you know, based on kind of what you're seeing happen in the world today? We, when it comes to the themes of the conferences, we kind of shift it based on, you know, what society and culture is happening. I should say what is happening in society and culture um, over time. So, for instance, our theme this past year has been even if. And knowing that, you know, it is a political year, um, it's a, a, a debate year, all of these different things, the voting year. So in knowing that it's going to be divisive already, and we've already seen that. I mean, if you have the news, if you turn it on as of this recording the last two weeks, it's been absolutely insane insane and it's been crazy and it's been fear provoking. There's been so much division. I mean, there's just hatred. There's evil in our country. And so knowing all of those things are present and running rampant throughout our, our country and society that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and different things in spiritual places. When we recognize that we wanted to have that in a sense, theme of resilience for men. Hey, even if we are not going to bow the knee, we're not going to conform to culture. We're not going to conform to our circumstances. We are going to continue to conform to Christ because I believe this, Paul, and I know you do too, that even if your circumstances don't change, your character always does. It's either dwindling or it's developing. And so helping oh. men recognize, come on, we want to dive into and press into your heart even if things don't go your way. So next year, we kind of have the theme of standing strong and embracing mm -hmm. God's power in his presence. And so when we stand strong, no matter what happens come November, right, we want to stand strong and do it together. And so kind of the themes, like you said, they're very much so geared around the climate of today's day and age. You know, as a counselor, I imagine you see people more divided than ever hmm. uh, without necessarily going down the political road. Yeah. I'm curious how we can go about with reconciliation in this country, or at least coming to a place where we can understand 
other people and love them as the children of Christ. Mm. I, I think there's a lot of vitriol and hatred in this world that really concerns me about what's going on, not only in our country, but globally. And I'm curious, as a counselor, how do you talk to people that find themselves caught up in that set of emotions and feelings that can easily weigh on them and get them focused back to that everyone is a child of God? Hmm. It's a great question because there are a lot of people, like you said, who I believe are basing some of their opinions, some of their decisions on feelings. And so we live in a postmodernistic, relativistic culture and society that maybe doesn't believe in absolute truth. And I believe in the absolute standard of truth, which being is God's word. And so what I try to help remind people of is, you know what, even out of God's word, you are to love people, right? Speaking the truth in love, there is a correlation with truth and with love. And I believe, as a dear friend of mine, Dr. Carl Benzio says, that people are dying because the truth is dying. And so the most loving thing we can do in a day and age is not just speak and profess and preach the truth of God's word, but live that out every single day. And so there's an old message uh, or an old quote that says, there are five gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. And most people will never read the first four. And so being able to say, Mm -hmm. what does that look like then to love people in the way that God would love. You have to recognize, though, I think sometimes um, we begin to weaponize love. And I think a lot of culture and society is weaponized love. Well, if you were loving, then you would just, in a sense, not just accept me for who I am, but affirm my behavior. And I don't think Christ ever affirmed like that type of behavior. But what he did is he accepted people exactly where they were, and he walked alongside of them. And I think we can do the same in such a time as this. Even though we may uh, agree to disagree, even though we have a lot of our differences, there are some times when we have to accept people for who they are while at the same time fighting and battling for truth for such a time as this in knowing that this is a battle that's so much bigger than us. This is a battle, in my opinion, that's so much bigger than you know red or blue, Democrat or Republican. This is a battle that really involves um, the spirituality of our country the heart of our nation. And so my goal in all of this is helping remind people of who God is. And again, knowing God more intimately in my own personal life, but then making it my goal and my responsibility and out of obedience to make his name known as well. And so that's where I think reconciliation takes place is when you're able to finally balance not just love, but also truth and the accountability aspect behind everything. Uh, Wonderfully said. I know that you talk about the four P's. Maybe you Hmm. could share about the four P's for our audience, what they mean and and how you utilize them in your work. Yes. So when it comes to the four P's, I'm assuming you're referencing like the different challenges that men are up against on a a daily basis. So things like past pressure, phones, and pornography. And so when I deal with uh, and work with men on a daily basis, those are four of the biggest things that I see as culprits that really rob men from stepping into uh, the freedom that I believe God wants us to live in. So that first one being your past. A lot of men struggle with the idea of, man, you know what, they feel as if their past disqualifies them from God's love, from God's forgiveness, or from God's grace. As a dear friend of mine out of Men's Alliance, David Mills says, we, that's the greatest lie, I think, that come against men in culture and society today. He says we can never, and we have to remind men all the time, that just because maybe you've made mistakes or just because you've had hardships come up against you or just because, in a sense, you may view these things as failures in your own life, you've made some bad decisions, that does not disqualify you from leading within your marriage and leading within your home and leading your children every single day. And so helping men not just, in a sense, pretend like the past never happened, but go into the depth of what happened and really get a greater understanding of, hey, how can we find freedom from the bondage that you were holding yourself in? Maybe that's shame. Maybe that's regret and so on and so forth where shame will say the phrase of this. If you really knew me, Paul, if you really knew what I was doing behind closed doors, if you really knew some of the decisions I've made in my past, you wouldn't like me. You wouldn't accept me. You wouldn't bring me on your podcast. But what covenant friendship and with things such as counseling, what those things try to expose is that vulnerability is not a weakness. Vulnerability is a strength because when you can take off the cape or the facade or the mask, you can wipe away the smile or the simply, hey, I'm doing fine thing. When you're able to do those things, that's where you're able to dive into the heart and the depths of 
of those things and actually get to the root because ultimately it's the root that produces the fruit. And so when we help people work through their past, then they can step into a more meaningful present and future moving forward. So the past, the second one is pressure. Men have a pressure to perform, pressure to provide, pressure to protect, a lot of things that are pushing back against men. And one of those pressures um, – is probably being present in the lives of their children. I try to remind men, especially as fathers, of the significance of their presence in their children's life, not just biblically and scripturally. Um, is that, you know, pressure? It's not even a pressure, but the privilege to be involved with your children there. But also statistically in science will say that kids, right, that are in a family where their father is engaged and their father actually shows up and is available and attuned to their needs, those kids will experience less mental health challenges and issues throughout their life. They actually will have a greater sense of academic performance and even athletic achievement and performance throughout their careers. On top of that, what's fascinating is that their identity growth and development takes place at a much more rapid, effective, and efficient rate when a dad is present and engaged in their children's life. But ex the exact opposite happens when a dad is absent or disengaged. And so being able to help men recognize that's not a pressure, in my opinion. That's a privilege, right? And when you recognize that pressure is a privilege, when somebody believes in you enough to be in a high-pressure situation in the first place, that's the only reason that you're there, you begin to view things differently. So again, past pressure, phones, um, I think that's an easy one. Uh, we live in a very preoccupied society and culture. I was at a soccer game recently, Paul, watching uh, my niece, Olivia, play soccer, and she's in this four- to six-year-old league at the YMCA locally, and here she was, you know, running around, picking daisies and doing all that. Our entire family is there cheering her on if she even runs in the right direction, right? But there was this one dad sitting next to me, and it broke my heart because I watched this other girl on the opposing team of Olivia's team, and she kept doing all of these things just to grab her dad's attention. And her dad was so consumed with his phone that eventually she started crying and screaming, would you just look at me? Dad, can mm. you just look at me? And I think there's so many men where we live with this almost technology addiction. Our, we're, we're the most digitally connected, relationally disconnected generation in society today. And I think phones play a lot into the role of loneliness that's happening as well. When we live in a current of loneliness, as Justin Whitmell early writes in his book, Made for People, we begin to recognize that, you know what, it's, it's so easy to fall into that trap. And I love how he defines loneliness. He defines loneliness as this, not as the hermit that doesn't ever come outside, but as the person that used to have friends. So in other words, before the promotion, before the kids, before the marriage, before the move, before all of these things, when we began to, in a sense, lack intentionality in our friendships, that's how we find ourselves in this current of loneliness. But when loneliness is the invisible illness of our day and age, and it's the, in a sense, undiagnosed diseases that are the most dangerous and deadly, we have to remind men that we need embodied friendship and that phones are a way through which we can enhance friendship, right? They're like the snacks, as Justin would reference, but they're not the main course or the meal of it all. We need embodied relationships for such a time as this. And then the last one, the phones really expedite, I believe, the pornography addiction that is running rampant throughout you know, society and culture today. Not only did we have this um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, but one of my dear friends, Jim Kress here at AACC calls it the porn-demic that we have experienced in life. And so he references these different, these five A's. He talks about how pornography, number one, is accessible. It's everywhere, right? It's affordable. It's free. It's the, in a sense, the drug and the addiction of choice within the church, especially because it allows you to remain anonymous, he says it's accelerated because you have the AI and the airbrush techniques that they're using now. It's really false intimacy. That is not what intimacy looks like, and it is skewing individuals' idea of what intimacy should look like within their marriage and within their homes. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, then the fifth day is that it can become addicting, and we're seeing that like never before, Paul. I mean from the young boys – that I'm seeing that the exposure rate to pornography has dropped by two years now. It's, I think, somewhere underneath 10 years old, which is absolutely wow. mind-boggling, and it's heartbreaking, and it's alarming, and we have to do something about it. But then what my goal is is as we come in, 
And it's not just about behavior modification. And it's not just about telling boys what they shouldn't be doing or what they shouldn't be watching, but it's about telling them and equipping them with what they should be doing, how to pursue intimacy and what intimacy really looks like from a biblical perspective, which is mastering the art of the shared experience. And my thing is, again, it goes back to vulnerability. I have a friend named Joshua Broom who has an unbelievable testimony, one that literally is jaw-dropping. But he puts it this way, and what he has learned, and he wrote in his book, The Seven Lies, that will ruin your life. He says, you are only as free as you are honest. And so I want young boys and I want men to be able to say, you know what? I am not going to live in the darkness anymore. I'm going to allow the light to continue to expose the darkness. And I'm going to step in a new truth each and every day of my life. So those are my four P's. Thank you for sharing those. Those are wonderful. I, you know, that, that pressure, it just, I can totally feel some of what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and in and, and, and number two, and it just, I appreciate your articulation of those things and what it's like to be under pressure to do certain things as a father. Hmm. Um, so this has been outstanding, but before we wrap this up, I, I just want to ask, you know, for our audience who many of whom are, are in their struggles and dealing with difficulties and as a counselor, you know, it all too well. Is there a piece or two of advice that you would offer our audience that are of hope, uh, a message of hope, that you would give them uh, just for them to cling to a little bit coming out of this? You know, the message of hope that I think I would give to them um, beyond the, you know, hope is never lost. Sometimes it needs to be redirected because hope is a person and hope has a name. Beyond that little aspect, I would really press into them uh, two principles that I teach in the book. The first one is that people feel really, really matters. And I was kind of touching on that when it came to um, you know, the whole entire idea of loneliness is that we don't just need people to surround us, though. We need the right people who will support us and sharpen us. And there's a lot of people who, in a sense, have gotten involved in maybe the wrong crowds or maybe they're, they're involved in individuals' lives who they're pouring a lot into them, but they don't feel like people are pouring a lot back into them as well. Find the right people that will help, in a sense, push you through and that will help carry you through the fire, but also recognize that you're never alone. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 43, verse 2. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you Mm -hmm. walk through the fire, you will not be burned and the flames will not set you ablaze. When we recognize that we're never alone in the fight and that God is with us every single step of the way. That is one of the most comforting things that I can even think of in my own personal life. And then the last thing I'll leave you with is that, again, we have to praise before our breakthrough. In the darkest moment and season of my life, Paul, where it was challenging and it was hard and I didn't want to show up to work, I didn't sometimes want to get out of bed, um, I was reminded of a quote by Nancy Lita Moss. And Nancy said this, I've recognized that no matter what up, whatever I come up against in this life, I can respond in one of two ways. She said, I can whine or I can worship. And she said, and it's impossible to worship without giving thanks. The research in the counseling and mental health space uh, behind the significance and the importance of gratitude and how gratitude can literally rewire the circuitry within our brain is absolutely fascinating. And so my thing for individuals is, hey, when you're going through the ringer, recognize who God is. And when you're asking him, as Job did at the end of the book of Job in Scripture, why, why, why? You see, God, in the midst of our whys, he answers the where. Because Job, at the end, in the last chapter of the book, it says this. He said, you know what, God? I had only heard with you, heard about you with my ears up to this point, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. Why? Because he recognized this truth, that God is always in the midst of our pain. He may not offer his perfect security from the fire, but Paul, he sure does offer his perfect security in the midst of it. That's the message of hope that I kind of want to leave every listener and viewer with today. Well, Zach, I cannot tell you how much we appreciate you and we appreciate the message you've brought here today, uh, the variety, the, the depth, and, and the importance uh, of what you're doing. Uh, you know, we just wish you the very best. Be blessed in your continued endeavor for your PhD, but for the message you're bringing, even if uh, it is just so powerful. And uh, I would encourage all of our audience to pick up his book uh, and, and, and dive deeper into what he's shared here today. To our audience, I want to say thank you. Uh, We appreciate your time. We appreciate your continued listening. Uh, We continue to hopefully bring guests just like Zach uh, and important messages that we believe you want and need to hear. Uh, Thank you so much for your time today. 
Good night and Godspeed.